Here's another example of the extreme value theorem. Find all maximum and minimum values of f of x equal to the absolute value of x squared minus 9 on the interval minus 1 to 4, including the endpoints. So that's a closed interval. So what does the extreme value theorem say? It says that f is a continuous function on a closed interval. So here are closed intervals from minus 1 to 4. Then f attains its maximum and its minimum value on that interval. So what are we going to have to do here? Somehow we're going to have to work around the absolute value sign. So first, let's get an idea of what the graph looks like. Now if I forget about the absolute value sign, we're looking at the function x squared minus 9. That we understand. That's going to be a parabola. What's going to happen here? Its y-intercept is going to be at minus 9. It's also going to be the vertex. The x-intercepts are going to be at x equal to 3 and x equal to minus 3. And then the bull is just going to face up. So if I connect the dots, I'll get my graph of x squared minus 9. Once I put the absolute value signs around things, what does that do? That's going to change all of my negative y values to positive y values. So the effect there is anything below the x-axis just gets flipped up. So that's going to be my graph of absolute value of x squared minus 9. Now, the interval that we're interested in is going from minus 1 to 4. So I'm only going to care about what's happening from here, come all the way down, then go all the way up to 4 here. So you notice our maximum is going to be at 0, our minimum is going to be at 3 with value equal to 0. So we're just going to reproduce that by pulling the function apart by itself without reference to the picture. So how are we going to do that? To do that, we're going to need to work around the absolute value sign. So before I can start doing anything, I need a definition of absolute value. So absolute value of y, what do we do? y is a positive number, we leave it alone. Okay, there's no sign there to worry about, so you just return the number as is. So if y is bigger than or equal to zero, absolute value of y is y. If y is a negative number, we're just going to take away the minus sign. The easiest way to take away the minus sign as a formula is just to multiply by minus 1, because minus times a minus gives me a positive. So if I take the absolute value of a negative number, I just multiply it by minus 1. Now I'm going to apply that to the function. So where I have y, pretend there's a box, and we're going to stick x squared minus 9 into that box. So the absolute value of x squared minus 9 it's going to be x squared minus 9 if x squared minus 9 is bigger than or equal to 0. And then it's going to be minus parentheses x squared minus 9 if x squared minus 9 is less than 0. Now, this business of x squared minus 9 less than or bigger than 0, okay, we want to break that down in the region, so what do we do? We find where x squared minus 9 is equal to 0. That's going to be when x is 3 or minus 3. And then all I need to do is check a point in each region to determine if I'm positive or negative in that region. So if I'm on the far side of minus 3, I put in a minus 4. What comes out of my function x squared minus 9 is going to be 7, so we're positive over there. In the middle region, I'm going to use 0. x squared minus 9, that's going to give me minus 9, so we're negative in the middle region. And then on this far region, past 3, we put a 4 in, and I get a 7 again. x squared minus 9 gives me a 7 out. So that's going to be positive on this far region here. Now we have f defined without reference to the absolute values. So what's our procedure for finding the maximum and minimum of a continuous function on a closed interval? If our function f has a derivative everywhere except at finitely many points, what we want to do is first find the critical points, so those are the points where the derivative is equal to 0 or undefined. Then we're going to take those points, take the endpoints, we apply f. The values that come out, we're going to compare. Among those values will be our minimum and our maximum. So I want to take the derivative. Now note, x equal to 3, we're expecting does not exist or undefined because we have a, a corner there. So we'll see that in a second. So let's consider what's happening off of x equal to 3. If my x is between minus 3 and 3, our derivative is going to be minus 2x. If 
we're looking at x less than minus three or x bigger than three, the derivative is equal to two x. So when can this be equal to zero? Well, zero is gonna wind up being in the region between minus three and three. So minus two x, if I put zero into that, I get zero out. So we're gonna have a critical point for the derivative being equal to zero at x equals zero. Okay, for my other piece, the only way we could get a zero out of that would be if x is equal to zero, but that's not actually in the region. So we only have to worry about this piece here. Now, how about x equal to three? Well, actually you might be worried about x equal to minus three also, but that doesn't show up in our interval, so it's not under consideration. So x equals three. What's happening here? If I take a look at my derivative on the left side of three, we're looking at the function minus two x. So as that goes in to x equals three, the value of the derivative is gonna go to minus six. So that would say as I go to the left, if I put a tangent line in there, its slope is gonna be minus six. Similarly, if I come in from the right, okay, the derivative is equal to two x. As I go to three, it's gonna say that the slope of the tangent line as I come in from the right should have slope equal to six. Now, minus six is not equal to six, so that's saying the tangent line from the left and the tangent line from the right don't agree. So that means our derivative is gonna be undefined at x equals to three. So that's gonna be another critical point. So I have critical points at zero and three. I wanna also throw in the endpoints at minus one and four. We're gonna apply f to all those points. So that's done right here. What do we notice? If I have put zero in, that's one of our critical points, nine comes out, that's my maximum. On the other hand, if I put three in there, again, that's another critical point, I get a zero out, and that's gonna be my minimum. So you'll note, we're not using the endpoints at all here to get our maximum or minimum. So this is how we get maximums and minimums when there's an absolute value around our function.